Okay, let's jump right into this. Um, this is going to be a legalistic, sure, but hopefully underneath it are some interesting questions about how we balance um, the push towards a lenient ruling, which makes it easy for people to observe, and the push for a values-based understanding of Jewish law, right? So when we're deciding Jewish law, are we just um, actually trying to figure out what is or is not the permitted approach to something, or are there also values that are coursing through that that should inform or at least uh, are created when the law gets, gets put in place and followed? So we're starting with some of the verses that, um, that Rosemary read before. The opening part of Parshat Chukat talks about the laws of what happens when you have uh, had contact with a corpse. Uh, in biblical law, when you had that much uh, contact with someone who had died, it rendered you tame. I've said this many, 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 many times. I'm going to say it again. Tame does not mean bad. It just means that it puts you in a, in, a, in a state of ritual distance. And in order to come back to holy things, you have to go through a purifying process. It doesn't mean pure and impure the way we use it in English it's as bad and, and good, but rather distanced from the holy. Han uh, verse, chapter 19, verse 11. Hanogeh b'meit l'chol nefesh adam. If you, if you have contact with the deceased of any nefesh, I know in modern Hebrew we use nefesh to mean soul, in biblical Hebrew it meant body. For the body of any adam, any person, adam is the most um, ecumenical way of referencing a human being in biblical uh, Hebrew. V'tamei shivat yamim, you, you enter this period of tuma for seven days. Hu yidchatabo, interesting actually, the, the root chet, which means sin, it also in the, uh, can also mean to cleanse from an impurity, uh, interesting enough. So you have to go through that process, Bayom Hashlishi on the third day, Uva Yom Hashvi on the seventh day, Yitar. Bim Loid Chata Yom Hashlishi, if you have not um, done the process on the third day and the seventh day, Lo Yitar, it doesn't work. Zot HaTorah, Adam Kemut Ba'ohel, this indeed is the, the law. Remember, in the, in the Torah, the word Torah does not mean Torah. In the Torah, the word Torah means ruling or teaching, instruction. This is the instruction of a person who perishes in a tent. Kol haba el ha'ohel v'chol asher ba'ohel yitma shivat yamim. This is a new rule. Earlier on, it said that if you actually have physical contact with the deceased, then you are in this category of me. Now we're learning that even if you share a tent, a tented space, right? And this is actually very significant in modern Jewish law, particularly for someone who's a Kohen, for someone who's a Kohen and takes it very seriously that they should not be anywhere near someone who has died, lest the Mashiach come tomorrow. I'm not, not sticking here. And the Kohen's uh, service is needed. Therefore, you'll see Kohanim not come into cemeteries. And if they come into cemeteries, they'll stay on pathways and make sure they were never in a space where both they and someone who's died is covered by the same, um, the same cover, right? So this is another stringency, or not a stringency, another way in which we understand that not even physical contact, but three-dimensional spatial contact with someone who has died renders you tame. Um, okay, that's enough for, for, for that text. Uh, any, any just questions on the meaning? Yes, Rosemary? Oh, let's get a microphone going around. One second, everyone. One sec, one sec, one sec, one sec. Um. Just by reading it, I was just thinking there are uh, jobs like people who clean the dead or wash and dress them up. Right. So these people are impure all the their life. Right. So um, you're, you're talking about someone who's on a Hebra Kadisha, right? Mm -hmm. And who is doing the very, very, very important mitzvah of, of, of bringing someone to burial. It's not that they are impure their entire lives, but every time they do one, they can't do another one for quite for quite a while, or if they do another one, it, it it distances how long they can return. And it doesn't mean that they're not living a normal life. It means that they can't come into the sanctuary to offer a sacrifice, right? It means that they have distance from certain ritual um, um, pl places in Jewish life, but not that they're diminished in any way. We might say that they are psycho psychologically and emotionally drained. I like thinking of Tameh and Tahor through those prisms. Right? It's not about clean or unclean. It's that if you have that much direct content with someone who has lost their life, it's hard for your own life force not to be sapped on some level, even if you might feel elevated by having done something so holy. 
So if you're on the Hebrew Kedisha, and remember the Hebrew Kedisha is a much later notion than these biblical rules. I, it's hard to imagine how it was done back then, but ostensibly, yes, you became Tame, and then you could no longer access the certain parts of ritual life until you had gone through the third day and seventh day. Um, so they can never pray in the morning they can, or in they, the No, evening. they can pray. You can pray when you're I mean, Tame. in the group. The, you can pray a part as a group. Minyan. No, you, you, you can pray as a Minyan, which oh, you can't. And, Let's not, we're, we're, we're dancing in anachronisms because the notion of praying in the minyan is post-temple, right? And the notion of going from being tamay to tahor in order to participate right. in temple life is pre-temple. So they weren't, didn't really overlap, but if, we're, if we go back, I don't know, to the year 500 BCE, right? Um, when the temple still stood, well, that's actually that's a bad example because the temple was destroyed at that point. But in, in, in pre, in, in during temple times, yeah. Um, when all these laws were um, still in place and we did not have the concept of davening in a minyan, if you were tamay because of this, it meant that you were tamay and there were certain things that you couldn't do, but it didn't mean that you couldn't participate in community or be with your family. Yes, Bob. Let's get by the microphone. You know, in the first couple of phrases, you, you explained some of the Hebrew. I didn't get it. At, I didn't understand it at all. You went pretty fast. Okay. From my understanding, so what are some of the? Uh, is there, well, what, what were you explaining? There, there are like a few words here that you said are this and they're not that, and they're this and they're that. That tame and tahor, which are often translated to English as impure and pure, I think those English translations give a sense of the word that were not intended by the Torah. I think tame and tahor really mean life ebbing versus life flowing. And that when you come into contact with someone whose life has ebbed completely, it has a life ebbing impact on you. And before you can come back into holiness, you have to go through a process. In English, those words denote something positive and negative. I don't think that's what the Torah meant by it. Go to the next source, okay? So this is not from Parshat Chukat. This is um, a narrative at, uh, towards the end of Bamidbar after the, um, the war with the Midianites. Uh, there's a lot of verses here. We'll go through this a little bit quickly because it's really to draw out one narrative detail. Chat, if you're following from home, it's, it's Numbers chapter 31, but we're going to skip around a bit in the chapter. By the bearer of shall the more God said to Moses, saying, Nakom nikmat b'nei Israel, avenge the Israelites for their war with Midian, me'et midanim, achar te'asef elamecha, meaning, Moshe, go to war, and afterwards you can come back to your people. Skip to verse 6. Moses sent a thousand from each tribe, Latzava, to make an army. Otam and Viet Pinchas ben Alzara Kohen Latzava. Pinchas, the one that we know from Parsha Pinchas, was the leader of this campaign. Uh, and he had sacred utensils and he had shofars to, to rouse the troops. Verse 7. Vayitzbu. This is the verb form of the, ver of the noun sava, which means a host or an army. They encamped al Mijan, or they, they engaged with warfare against the Midianites. Kasher Tzivad or Nayavashet, God has commanded. Vayahar Gul Kozachar, they killed a lot of men. In fact, all the men. Skip to verse 13. I mean, it's right there, but if you're from home, skip to verse 13. Vayetzu Moshe Be'elazar Kohen B'chol Nesei Ha'idad Likratam, El Mechutz Lamachana. When the war was over and the troops are coming back, Moses, Elazar, uh, and all of the uh, princes come out to greet the returning soldiers. Now, the soldiers have done what while they're out there? Which means they've come into contact with whom? Dead bodies. Dead bodies, which means that their ritual status is ostensibly tame. They haven't done anything wrong. I mean, we're not having a moral conversation right here. It may be that they did something wrong, but they, they did what God asked them to do. In warfare, you kill people. If you kill someone, you're hand in hand and, and probably, you know, tented with someone who's died, which means when you come back, you might be celebrated as heroes for winning the war. But ritually speaking, you are Tame and therefore you need to um, have a certain quarantine outside the camp. That's what it says. They said, all of you, well done on the war, but camp outside the camp, Shibat Yamim, seven days. Why? Kol Horeg Nefesh. Anyone who killed someone, and killing someone back then was not with a machine gun. It was hand-to-hand. -hand. Anyone who touched a corpse, you've got to go through this process, exactly as Parshat Chukat said. On the third day and the seventh day, you and all of the people who you, um, who you captured. 
uh, verse 48, so it skips to the end of the chapter. All of the commanders approached, the, 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 the commanders of the thousands and the hundreds, verse 49. They said to Moses, Nas u at at Rosh on Shei Hamilchama. We checked all of our troops, the Israelite troops, Asher biadenu. That is in our hands. Velo nifkad mimenu ish. Not one of them is unaccounted for. Meaning, what miracle happened during this war? Nobody. Nobody no, which person died? No Israelite died. What is the halachic significance? Halachic is an anachronistic term here. What's the legal significance of the Torah saying? that all of the dead people who were dead in this situation were not Jewish. It means that the verses that say that a corpse defiles means any corpse. There's nothing um, jingoistic about this, right? We're not saying that if you have come into contact with a Jewish or an Israelite corpse, therefore you would go into that status, but that a, 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 a non-Jewish corpse is somehow lesser. It's a, it's a stringent law, but it's a stringent law that elevates the humanity of all people. I know that's a weird thing to say, right? Let's say the Torah had said, since nobody of the Israelites had died, and all the dead people are just non-Jews, uh, all those laws from Parshat Chuka don't apply because we're really only talking about the sanctity of a Jewish or Israelite corpse. It's not what it says. So the, the straight understanding from the Torah that says that any person who has died, because of the sanctity of that body, confers tum'ah, that sense of life ebbing force, upon a person who touches it. And that is pretty much understood to be the case through Mishnaic law as well. Turn to source three. This is the Mishnah, Mishnah Ohalot, an entire tractate dealing with tents, right? Not how to put them up like you're camping, but the law specifically of how tum'ah is transmitted through a tent. In the 18th chapter of Ohalot, we have the following Mishnah. This is now you know, a thousand plus years after the Torah. Midorot Hagoyim, dwelling places where non-Jews have lived. You might, and the word um, Madur here, the word Dira, apartment, right? Ladur means to to um, to live somewhere. Tamein, we suspect that they are Tamei. We are. It's translated here as unclean, but we've been through that, so it doesn't mean unclean. We suspect that they might have what? What might we suspect be hanging out in the? In a, in a dwelling place of a non-Jew, potentially an unburied body. Kama yishebetuchan v'yetzarich b'dika. How long um, will do, does the non-Jew whose, um, whose dwelling place you uh, you have gotten to have to have lived there, such that you'd need to check it? By the way, we're talking here about a non-Jewish town or neighborhood that has been conquered by Jewish people and you're now going to be inhabiting it as Jews, you have to make sure that the place is kosher. But kosher here doesn't have to do with the dishes, it has to do with whether or not there's any tuma hanging out, any ghosts hanging out in the, um, in the house. Arba imyom. If you knew that an Anju lived there 40 days, afal pisha ein imo isha, even if a man lived there alone without a woman. What's the implication? It's not what you think it is. The implication is whether this has any historical evidence or not, that the Jews suspected that when non-Jewish women had miscarriages, which was very common, that rather than bring them out to the larger communal uh, um, cemeteries, they would bury them in their own property, right? By the way, could have happened, right? That people, look, pregnancies were lost all the time back then, and the commentary in this says that even if there was no non-Jewish woman living in that house, meaning even though you don't have a suspicion that somehow women were having miscarriages there and they were buried in the property, you still have to suspect that there are, non, there are non-Jewish dead bodies that might be in the property. You have to check it out. At Mahim Bodkim, Mishnah 8, what do they check? At Habibim, the drains and the pipes, Ha'amukim, Vet Ha'mayim Hasruchim, and foul-smelling water, right? The idea is that before you're going to make this a Jewish inhabitant, you have to make sure that Jews can move in and not uh, be concerned about becoming Tamei simply by being in a place where there's a dead body. Reinforcing what rule that we saw from the Torah, non-Jewish bodies confer Tum'ah, right? That, again, by the way, is an uh, elevation of the status of a non-Jewish person, right? Even non-Jewish people confer the status of Tum'ah. Look at the next one. This is from the Talmud Tractate Yivamot. And we have a different understanding. 
a lone voice in rabbinic literature that says, no, I don't think the verses from Parshat Chukat that we read before apply to a non-Jew. Tanya, we learn in an earlier source. This is the second source on that page. V'chein haya Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai Omer. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, a very, very important sage from the era of the Mishnah, said, Kivrei goyim enan mitamin ba'ohel. That the uh, graves of non-Jewish people do not confer tum'ah by means of a tent. Meaning, it's the case that if you are in the presence of a Jewish corpse and the same tenting is over both of you, that Jewish corpse confers tuma unto you. And we had thought up until now, based on the Torah and the Mishnah, that the same is true for non-Jews. Rabbi Shimon Yochai says, no. And, and, what, and what's his proof text? Shinamar, because it says in a verse in the prophet Ezekiel, Atem tsoni, God is speaking to the Jews, you are my flock, tson mariti, the sheep of my pasture, adam atem, you are adam, right? And what does Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai learn from that? Atem kruim adam, you, my people, Jews, Hebrews, Israelites, you get the title adam, even though the word adam is the most ecumenical of words, ve'en hagoyim kruim adam, and non-Jews are not called adam. Why is that significant? If you go back to the first text, all of this has to do with Adam kiamut ba'ohel. When an Adam dies in a tent, then if you share that tent with that person, that tumah is conferred to you. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochar says, based on Ezekiel, Adam only refers to us. The question that no one has the answer to is, what is he saying and why is he saying it? There are several possibilities. He could be speaking from a sort of racial communal superior, superiority complex. When the Torah refers to a human being, it refers to a full human being. Who are full human beings? Us. We, not them. Right? And therefore, um, since we are the Adam and not they, then it is our dead bodies who confer this Tumat, not theirs. Or he could be pushing for a leniency not because he's moved by a particular value proposition, but he says, there are a lot of places in the world where you might run into non -de to dead non-Jews. There are many more non-Jews than Jews. If we have to be concerned that any place we go to that a non-Jew once lived, that there might be a non-Jewish person buried there, we won't be able to go anywhere. It's hard enough for us to figure out where to go where no Jews have died, right? We can't interview Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but the impact of his ruling is lenient. The feeling of his ruling is uncomfortable. The impact of his ruling is you have to be less concerned when you go into places because if only non-Jews lived there, all right, if they died, big deal. Not big deal that they died, but it doesn't, it doesn't have, a, a non-Jewish body doesn't have ritual impact on me. That's a leniency. But the leniency is through the prism of saying, why? Because a non-Jewish body is halachically, legalistically, like the carcass of an animal rather than like the corpse of a human being. A carcass of an animal does not render the same kind of impurity as a, as, as a human corpse does. It could Sandra. Just be different. It doesn't necessarily have to render it as a, car a carcass of an animal. It could simply be different. Right, so what Sandra's saying is that it could be in between, that he's not saying, since they're not like a, our corpses, they're like animals, just be a different category, and that category is the category of a non-Jewish person whose death was probably sad, but it doesn't impact our ritual life. By the way, that's a very kind of normative thing to say that our, our laws affect, that us. affect us. And we're affected by the, like, in the same way that we're not affected when we were waiting for a minion, when Hector, whom we love as, as a member of our staff, when he walked into the room, he didn't affect us ritually. We couldn't do the service without him because he sets everything up. But because he's not of the covenant, there's nothing against him. He has a different faith. He doesn't impact our ritual life. This could be just a natural extension of that. The non-Jews with whom we live, they live, they die. Their deaths don't impact us in the same way that Jewish deaths do. Not because they're lesser. They just don't. It's a different thing. We don't know exactly what he meant. What we do know is that it makes us a little bit uncomfortable to imagine. Um, I want you to, um, we're going to read for a second this um, um, little story uh, or remembrance by Rabbi Ethan Tucker, my dear friend and former Chavruta, who's one of the founders of Mechon Hadar, who was writing about this topic. Um, Alan, do you want to read this into the microphone? 
Years ago, I was privileged to share time in the Beit Midrash of the Jewish Theological Seminary with Rabbi Morris Shapiro. Rabbi Shapiro had been a childhood prodigy at Yeshivat Hochme Lublin in Poland. He was a Holocaust survivor who made it to America and served as a community rabbi. In his later years, he devoted his time to learning and to helping other beginning learners on their own journeys. And I'll just interject, interject that when I was in rabbinical, in rabbinical school, Rabbi Shapiro was the rabbi of the Beit Midrash. He would just sit there, study all day, and he was able to be there to help you understand a text. He was a, a beautiful gentleman. In one of my many conversations with him, he spontaneously brought up this text of Rabbi Shimon ben Yohai. You know, he said, that text got me through the camps. Surprised, I asked him to elaborate. He explained that Rabbi Shimon's statement here had enabled him to see his Nazi persecutors as being animals, as being something less than people. Had he had to confront them as true human beings, he said, as moral agents who were nonetheless choosing to perpetrate this unspeakable evil, he would have lost all faith in God and humanity and would have been sapped of any will to survive. Just pause for one second. It's just an unbelievable testimony, right? This is a tremendous scholar who knows the Talmud basically by heart, who was in the face of the most unspeakable evil that non-Jews could, per could perpetrate on Jews. And this one, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saying that the, the non-Jews are not religiously, ritually part of Adam, and that their corpses don't render us the same way Tameh, which means that somehow they're of a lesser human level, which is a terrible thing to say about anyone, saved him. He couldn't have gotten through it had he not held on to that notion. Keep going. It was precisely the, dehumaniz the dehumanization in this text that lifted up his own humanity and allowed him to live another day. Right, as if he was saying to himself that my goal is to live as high as possible as an Adam in the presence of those who almost lost their status as Adam because of the way they're acting. As if this analysis was not stunning enough, he then added, one of the things we learned from the Nazis is that it is forbidden to talk this way anymore. Rabbi Shimon's text for him was a one-off. It appeared at a critical moment for him and then was retired. Meaning, don't use this as your way of understanding basic non-Jews in the world. And by the way, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai lived under the impression of Romans who were probably treating Jews not that dissimilar to the way Nazis were. So he came by, if his teaching was motivated by value and not just by law, he came by it honestly. And Rabbi Shapiro is saying, use it in a foxhole and then discard it. You do not want to live this way. Go ahead. But the Nazis revealed how a dehumanizing text that might serve as an escape pod for the oppressed could easily turn into a gas chamber in the hands of the powerful. So this is heavy stuff and it begins with quote unquote you know, some archaic rules about using the ashes of the red heifer to bring yourself mm -hmm. back from a status of impurity to purity. And it, what it gets down to is, who do we include in what, what categories? When do we claim a leniency because it makes life easier, even if that leniency is tied to a value that is uncomfortable to articulate? And sometimes a value which is uncomfortable to articulate in general situations can be a salvation to someone who needs some way to understand how a human being could act unhumanly, right? The Nazis were dehumanizing us and murdering us, and therefore, in some ways, reducing themselves from the status of being worthy of being called humans. And Rabbi Shapiro would have said, had a Nazi died in front of him and he shared a tent with him, he would have relied on Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saying, this person lived, this person died, he confers no ritual um, change to me because he's right below that level. One second, Rosa, because there was a hand up over here. Rosemary? Yeah. Let's give Rosemary the microphone. Um, what Ben Shimon says, uh, it's, uh, it's more logical because right now we are living in a land uh, here or in Middle East 
we don't know who has lived there before. I mean, I was going to school. They started in one of the neighborhoods to dig to make the road, yes. and they found a lot of bodies because years, years ago, I don't know when there was a cemetery there, yes. but people had built and lived there. So uh, it's logical to accept that because if not, we can't live anywhere. Right. How do we know who was underground? Right. And again, so Rabbi Shimon Bar Chai might have just been a pragmatic rabbi issuing an, a lenient ruling to make life more livable, or he might have been trying to tell us something about how he understood non-Jews, or he was saying that it's that to, to make the statement is not turn them into animals, it just creates a third ritual category, and to say that, that if you're in our covenant, your bodies impact us, and if you're not, it's not that we don't care about you, but your bodies don't impact us in the same way. Right? That's that's less heavy, less less um, um, less uh, laden down with, with 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 what could be painful. Yes, Rosa, will you give Rosa the mic? Dehumanize us because it was easier for them to do their job if they didn't see us as human. But the commander of the Auschwitz concentration camp admitted to that. He, he said, making us look inhuman, making us treating us as human, just made it a whole lot easier. To yeah. kill them because they didn't appear human to yeah. them in the well, I think it was both, Rosa, right? And without getting too deep into a discussion of the Shoah, I think it's both the case that since the society for a generation or more <clears throat> had convinced themselves that Jews were less than human, it actually created the raison d'etre for the Shoah. And then continuing to think of them as subhuman or as rat made, made it more easy for them to justify them. Yeah, of course. And in the process, Rabbi Shapiro is saying, what the Nazis felt about us is really what they did to themselves because they lowered themselves from the status of humanity. Sandra. Isn't, isn't it ironic that the Rabbi Shapiro using the tools of Nazi use to be able to annihilate us yes. allows him to survive? Yeah. It's, They're also dehumanized. Yeah. There's a statement, I can't remember how to say it in Aramaic, that sometimes when a fellow rabbi hears a rabbi say it, it says, if I hadn't heard him say it, I never would have believed it, right? If you hadn't heard such a gentle, moral, extraordinary rabbi say this, you couldn't have imagined that he would say it. But once he said it, you have to reckon with it because he wasn't saying it to make an impact. He was saying it because he was deep inside it. Last comment, Bob, and then we'll... Let's give him by the microphone. I would, I would simply prefer to look at it at the, at the covenant among the Jews gives each of the Jews a special... Uh, status among the community. Yeah. I know it's very tribal, but I prefer to look at it that way. Yeah. Listen, I understand that. Uh, there are aspects of our tradition that are tribal, right? And there are expressions of tribalism that go over the top and become exclusionary and becomes triumphalist and it becomes murderous, right? There are expressions of tribalism that say, I live and I love and I care in concentric circles. I do care about my, f I care about all you. I care about my family more. Sorry, right? And I care about all the people in this room, and I care about other people in other shuls, but I care about the people in this shul more. And I care about people who are, belong to different faiths in, a, in the city, but I care about the Jews in the city more. Like, there's something about tribalism which is very, very natural, right? And, and I, therefore, and particularly when it comes to the ritual life of a community, it makes sense that we are impacted and moved by the presences of fellow travelers in our faith more, or at least differently, than those who are not. So there's Rab the last two sources we'll just leave because it- Rabbi, it, 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 Rabbi, yes, I will. may I ask a quick question? I hope yeah. it's quick. It may be anachronistic and it may just be that seven is an important number, but is there any meaning in the fact that we mourn those closest to us Shiva with seven days and the full time after, in a sense, commemorating a life that one took in battle it doesn't stop at the three days, it's the seven days. That yeah. that to me is less tribal. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you, were, you were right in the lead up to the question that we have certain iconic numbers in our tradition and seven is one of them. There are many reasons why Shiva is said at seven, including there are places in the Torah where there seemed to be a wailing for seven days. There's also in halachic literature that the first, 
that of the seven days of Shiva, the days that are considered on a higher plane are more intense are the first three days. Mm -hmm. So it's not totally coincidental that to this day, as we think about our observance patterns, there's a three-day period and a seven-day period. And when it talked about um, someone recovering from contact with a dead person, not their own, necessarily their own loved one, there was a three-day quarantine and then a longer seven-day quarantine. How all, all of that got thrown into a soup pot and then it got born as as, as uh, ritual law over hundreds of years of cooking. And, and I agree with you that I don't think it's a coincidence that those numbers are the same. Okay. Uh